You are now tuned into the truth frequency. We are TFR. TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. participant in some of the most insidious lies and witness to deeds that no crazed man can imagine. I spent years watching you from my uh, lofty position to know that you were the one I could trust. And why did you lie to me? There still exists some secrets which should remain secret. Truths that people are just not ready to know. Who are you to decide that? The world's reaction to such knowledge would be far too dangerous. Dangerous? You mean in the sense of outrage? Like the reaction to the Kennedy assassination, or MIAs, or radiation experiments on terminal patients. Watergate, Ron Contra, Roswell, the Tuskegee experiments. Where will it end? You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Get out! Off what? You'll kill me? Always remember, dissension's the greatest form of patriotism. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies. We have before us the opportunity to forge a new world order. Yes, we can. And you say. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories. Our lives most convincingly hidden between two truths. Well, I guess it won't end. No! I don't have time for this. This is about saving the future of humanity. We know things are bad, worse than bad. We know the air is unfit to breathe and our food is unfit to eat. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. The line must be drawn here. This far, no farther. I want you to get up right now. Go to your windows, open them and stick your head out and yell, I'm a human being. My life has value. And I'm not going to take this anymore. listening to the Revolutionary Radio Project with your host, Rob Skiba. Hello and welcome to the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba. And wow, if you guys only knew how much uh, trouble and issues we got into just trying to get this broadcast on the air. It has been really bizarre. Uh, you know, whenever I play that intro, you know that we're going to be talking about some sort of conspiracy. And uh, tonight, maybe a really huge conspiracy dealing with science. Uh, and I'm going to bring two people on that have been on the Revolutionary Radio Project before. Robbie Davidson and Brian Mullen. And last week I actually had a guest scheduled to be on and the last minute things didn't work out. So uh, he wasn't able to come on last week. So uh, TFR automatically uh, just sort of recycles and it will play a rebroadcast of a previous episode, just kind of at random. And it just so happened that they picked the episode I did with Brian Mullen. So that was appropriate. I think that they aired that one last week and that we have Brian uh, on again this evening. So uh, Robbie, are you there, sir? I'm here. All right. Brian, are you there? I'm here. All right. We got everybody on. Wow. Crazy just getting this show started, but uh, we're off and running now, so let's just jump in. Uh, we're going to talk about a new video that just came out. It was uh, produced by Robbie Davidson and Brian Mullen. It's called Scientism Exposed, but that's not the first video Robbie's done. Robbie, you've done another one. Uh, we've had you on the show talking about it before called The Global Lie. What, went, what was that one about, just real quick? 
Well, the global lie uh, came out at the beginning of the year, and uh, it just was talking kind of about uh, our world and going through everything comparative to the Bible in a literal sense. And uh, that was kind of one of my major um, you know, videos that I put out uh, on my channel on YouTube. I've had out for just a little over a year now. Uh, and then from there, I started creatively thinking about uh, what I would do next, and it was uh, coming up to what we're talking about tonight, Scientism Exposed, and that was the uh, first major uh, release on DVD, so I'm quite uh, excited about that. It's been amazing to uh, to have Brian be a big part of that as well, so I'm looking forward to uh, tonight's talk. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, so, Brian, what uh, was it that made you decide you wanted to get involved with Robbie's next project? Uh, well, really, uh, Rob, Robbie reached out to me. Um, yeah, he he'd seen that I was, I was coming into the Christian faith, and uh, he told he told me about the project. And uh, I'd already been looking into uh, uh, geocentrism and flat Earth theory and things like that, and uh, I've been finding a lot of uh, areas of science that were being stretched and, and possibly lies. And so when he asked me to, to come on board, I I said yes, of course. <laughs> I was very excited. Now, you come from somewhat of a, a science background, don't you? Yes, yes. I have a, I have a civil engineering degree and now work as a structural engineer, so I've uh, been through a lot of physics and uh, astronomy, things like that. Now, what was it that got you intrigued about Flat Earth as an engineer and as a, a scientist uh, yourself? Uh, well, really, I uh, I just saw a couple videos and a couple of questions popped in my head that said, "Wow, I've never thought about that before." And I just said, "This this can't be," because I was I was a huge space nerd when I was a, a kid, and uh, you know, always yeah. looking up at the sky, th- thinking, you know, looking I'm looking at stars that are light years away, thousands of light years away, and uh, so I said, "Oh, I can I can disprove this pretty quickly." And uh, well, I couldn't. <laughs> the more I looked into it, the more I found that uh, flat Earth theory actually carried a lot of weight. And uh, so here I am putting videos out there and, and trying to get to the bottom of this. That's really how I got into it all. And what led, you said you recently came into the Christian faith. Uh, the Flat Earth had something to do with that? Oh, yeah, it had a, a lot to do with it because uh, when I was growing up, uh, we had our, our family Bible that had a, a, a depiction of the Flat Earth in it. And therefore, when I was a kid, uh, being into space, I kind of thought, well, this can't be true, or this, they, they couldn't have known what was, you know, I, I assumed it was written by man for that reason. And uh, so studying flat earth theory and then finding Bible verses that, that I mean, do, I, I in my opinion, uh, kind of a, allude to a, a flat stationary earth or a, a definitely a stationary earth has really brought me into it. And then uh, just meeting people, in a movement, especially my wife, uh, I, I came to, to realize that, wow, this is this really is the truth. And so it was science and trying to prove uh, this theory wrong that really, really brought me into it. Yeah, so in the New Testament, we have a situation where Paul tells Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding vain or profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. In other words, there is something out there that is calling itself science that opposes the Christian faith. And Paul is telling Timothy, stay away from that. So, uh, Robbie, what, what, uh, I know that that's uh, a verse that plays prominent, uh, a, a prominent role in uh, I believe it's on the back of the DVD, isn't it, on Scientism Exposed? It is. Yeah, and it's actually the very opening of the film. So, again, it kind of starts off, the movie starts off with that verse, and then it just transitions uh, into uh, the rest of it. But, again, for me, it was really important to get this out. And, again, you know, having something that really just got people questioning rather than something telling people, you know, what to believe or telling them that they're dumb if they believe something it was it was meant to put something together that really they would just be able to start questioning their reality, start questioning what they had been taught as proven, you know, fact and, and truth. So you know, it obviously runs into like the evolutionary um, paradigm, getting through you know with all the millions of years. And one of the taglines is you know, do you believe in billions or do you believe in the Bible? And again, we're dealing with like billions of years ago and billions of miles away, right? And again, they wrap everything in these absurd numbers 
And a lot of the times people look at this as, oh, it's proven, it's, it's science. But all along, it's just scientism. It's just theory, it's theoretical, you know, um, basically philosophy. And, and it's not real, true, empirical science. So uh, to me, it was just really important because I've mentioned before that it doesn't matter, you know, whether you're an atheist, an agnostic, a Christian, or a Buddhist, or a Muslim, every single person their worldview is shaped by scientism, if you actually think about it. Because, again, our reality, no matter what we're looking at, we look at it through a scientific lens when it comes to the cosmos, when it comes to the origins. And one uh, really powerful thing that's also on the back of the DVD, um, and it's mentioned in different uh, promo materials for the, uh, for the movie, um, is uh, on the back. But, again, it's pretty profound if you actually think about it. But what if everything modern-day science has taught you about your origins is wrong? Make no mistake. The very foundation of all mankind's knowledge depends on what is believed to be the truth about the origin of all that exists. And again, it's really, really important because everything that shapes our mind are based on the origins. And again, we're dealing with the Big Bang. We're dealing with evolution. We're dealing with all of these things. So again, it was meant to put that person on a journey to start questioning things even beyond there when they start looking up and saying, well, maybe there's something up with the stars or the moon or the sun maybe things aren't as far away as what we're being told. How do we know? You know, is this truly scientific or is this just what they've been telling us? So I think a lot of people can benefit um, and, you know, start their quest for truth after watching a movie as, such as Scientists and Exposed. So br- break it down for us. What is the difference then between science and scientism? Scientism would be more of a belief system. It would, uh, I mean, we're when we're talking about science, and again, in the in the film, it's uh, very uh, clearly addressed that uh, anyone that was involved, we have no problem with science, empirical science, something that can be tested and observed and repeated, and you know, based on the uh, scientific method. Where scientism, again, is kind of it's like a belief system masqueraded, uh, you know, telling us that it's science, but all along, it's really just a belief system. It's just theories. Uh, of men, but also have a very spiritual, sinister nature that, that's behind it. And that's something that comes you know, out very clearly. People start to see that there is a hatred uh, towards God of the Bible, um, also everything that the Bible stands for. And again, if you're the, the devil and you're going to basically try to take out you know, the authority and the credibility of the Bible, you're going to hit right at the foundations. And the foundations are found in creation, in Genesis, right from the very beginning, his assault started just start chipping away because once you open that up and once you start to, you know questioning well they obviously didn't know we don't we know for sure that it wasn't you know made in six days so it had to, you know we know that's wrong so then everything else is open to interpretation or open to you know um you know not believing what uh, what it's, it's saying to be true so i think that it's very important when you start looking at uh, if the foundations get rocked on anything, whether it's a building, I mean, I'm sure Brian can talk more about as an engineer and getting into things like this, but uh, really foundations, cornerstones are really important. So once you start taking those out, everything else starts to fall. Now, one of the arguments I always hear uh, regarding this issue, because I've been on record as saying the Bible is a flat earth book from Genesis to Revelation for better part of, uh, well, almost well, since April of 2015, when I started looking into it myself, I'm going, holy cow, it's the Bible, the whole thing is a flat earth book. You know, uh, you know I used to say Isaiah 40:22, like many others, well, see, circle the earth means globe. Uh, no, no, circle means circle, and Isaiah knows the difference because he wrote about a ball earlier uh, in, you know, in the same book. So he knows the difference between uh, the Hebrew word for ball and the Hebrew word for circle. And the King James translators knew the difference. It's like, well, why don't what what why did we, you know, standard Christian out there, start all of a sudden taking the word circle and making it a sphere? And you know, I listen to people like uh, Dr. Carl Baugh and Kent Hoven and a lot of those guys. I, I really kind of grew up with those guys listening. I had all their uh, audio cassette teachings and VHS sets and everything like that. And they would talk about that and say, see, you know, even the people of the Bible, you know, they knew the earth was a globe, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. And I just parroted what they said. But, but then I just went back and opened up Genesis again. And, you know, people think this flat earth thing is a psyop. Well, if it's a psyop, it started with the Holy Spirit because, you know, the authors of Scripture who wrote about the earth, uh, if we believe that Scripture is divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit and written by men, clearly 
uh, were inspired to write about it as a circular, still flat earth set on pillars under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars were placed on day four. And once you remove your preconceived bias that we're all taught to believe and just just let the text speak for itself, you don't get very far. You get Genesis 1, and you quickly realize this is talking about a snow globe. So then, now what I'm hearing a lot from Christians out there who don't want to accept this is that, well, it's all allegorical or metaphorical. It's all speaking in symbolism. So uh, what, uh, what is your response to that reaction? Uh, my response to that reaction is that it's kind of a double standard, in my opinion, because a lot of the uh, people that are saying this, they're ones that hold to six-day literal creationism. So they right. can pick and choose what's literal and what's not. And then furthermore, I mean, if you actually want to play that game and say it's all allegory, how can you take Isaiah 40:22 and say that's a globe? I thought that was allegory. That has nothing to do with the reality, right? So I think that it sets people up not being able to use any scripture when it comes to creation. So, I mean, if you actually stop and think about it, um, you know, if it came down to a literal type meaning, how many verses in the Bible support a heliocentric Big Bang universe? How many verses? None. I mean, None. zero. Exactly. And so, I mean, every verse that we support for an enclosed cosmology, uh, however you look at it, and I mean, whether we know 100%, sometimes we get accused like, well, you don't even know 100%, you know, your model. Well, that's not the point. The point is we se- severely doubt what we've been taught. And I would say that throughout the Bible, over and over and over, you had mentioned, uh, you know, whether it's fixed, uh, firm, or, or pillars. I mean, it's one thing if it's used once, but verses over and over and over again seem to say that this is significant and we should pay attention to it. And why would it just be, you know, poetry? So I look at it like, no, there's something a lot deeper going on. I think for the most part, people don't want to seem ignorant. They don't want to seem dumb, which is strange because the science world already laughs at Christians, whether it's, you know, six-day literal creationism or having their dinosaur museums or whatever. So they're already going to be laughed at. So I don't understand why they need credibility. But then again, you get into, well, what about Christian scientists? What about Christian astronauts? And I'm sure we'll talk more about NASA and space later in the program. But again, I think it's a huge problem. I think it's something that we have to address, but we have to be kind of like wise as serpents and gentle as doves. I think that it takes grace, it takes patience, and sometimes, this is the way I explain it, because, again, remember, this conspiracy is so big, most people think that it's so big it's almost impossible in their heads. That's like going from someone that, that thinks that JFK, the official story, is real, and jumping right to the moon landing. It's a shock to the system. You can't do that. You have to kind of go through, you know, JFK, then 9-11, then maybe, you know, chemtrails or whatever. You work your way up, because before Flat Earth, the moon landing was the most outrageous conspiracy, you know, even in conspiracy conspiracy circles so i'm saying when it comes to christians and your question was when it came to a lot of christians understand that their mindset really aren't you know in like some people are looking into certain things like 9-11 uh so again i think the moon landing and again we can talk more about that but i think if you can get someone believing that possibly there's something weird going on quite possibly they didn't land on the moon i think they're open to a lot more but the minute they say no 100 percent they land on the moon good luck trying to teach them that the earth is flat i mean it just it's just going to fall flat no pen intended <laughs> yeah so uh, brian you, you weren't really on the christian page at first so when you started watching videos out there and you started questioning oh what, what if this world really is flat what prevented? What was it in your mind that prevented you from saying, "Well, you know, the Bible's just poetry; it's just allegorical"? Why did you just decide to accept it as literal? Well, that was a, a pretty long journey for me because I, I, uh, I'd always, I would get to Genesis one, or when I would try to read the Bible when I was younger, and I would say, "This is not our world that it's describing." Because to me, I thought it was describing at least a geocentric world, uh, uh, and uh, you know, and also a flat world. And so I always kind of just discounted Christianity. I was actually raised Catholic, and so I, I, I got to the confirmation, of the, the last sacrament. I said, no, nah, this isn't for me. I don't believe this. And I went completely secular worldview. And uh, then as I, I, I got into the, the truth movement or started seeking truth, as, as Robbie talked about, um, I, I started to see that there was, there was de- definitely evil in this world, and it kind of led me into a spiritual path. And uh, actually, I, I had to say, when I was in, in college, I did realize that the moon landing was fake. I, I mean, it was pretty obvious to me. And uh, I went and tried to 
to talk to some of my to my fellow engineering students about it, and they they basically laughed at me and told me I was crazy. And I and I said this is really obvious. So I'd already known that the that the moon landing was definitely I I, I for myself had said it was fake, and so. When I started to, to look into this, I said, okay, the moon landing, moon landing's fake. And then when I started to look into flat Earth theory, everything kind of clicked for me. And uh, I'd already gone down a, a spiritual path. I got kind of in the new age, into the new age movement and uh, Hinduism a little bit. And uh, I, I really had kind of a, a I almost want to say I, I, I was very opposed to Christianity. And uh, I started to realize that just like I had been kind of trained to laugh at the idea of a flat earth, you know, like, are you going to fall off the edge and saying things like that? I started to realize, whoa, I'm, I'm just as trained to reject uh, Jesus or and, and Christianity, the Bible. And so I said, well, wait a second here. Is this the same thing? Is this deception really that deep? And so I started to look into it and I, I started to, to read things in the Bible and read verses like the verse in Timothy and, and just, it, it really started to, to just wow in my face. Like this is this is really describing everything that's happening and so much more. And and uh, so my my worldview, uh, as Robbie mentioned, the foundation of my worldview from the Earth going from 4.3 billion years old to wow, maybe it's maybe this is literal truth here, and there really isn't any evidence to show that it isn't true. Uh, it's 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 been quite a journey. And uh, that's that's pretty much how I got to where I'm at, I am now. You know, when you realize that the Bible was written by over 40 people over a period of about mm-hmm. 1,400 plus years, uh, you know, in total, and yet you know, you've got a number of people. I mean, you got Job. I think predates uh, uh, the Torah, predates Moses. So you you've got Job describing the cos cosmological worldview of a snow globe essentially uh talking about the the sky is strong like a molten looking glass you know it's a solid thing over us you know and job and genesis one you got moses giving the creation account uh then later you know uh, david talks about things of creation in the psalms and then so- uh, solomon follows suit and talks about more and then you got isaiah and others i mean anybody who spoke over that time period of let's say 1500 years they all spoke in unanimous agreement on the same cosmological worldview with no variance. So, you know, like to, to Robbie's point earlier, to say that that's all poetic, but, you know, every author just decides to be a poet. Okay, you could say David's a psalmist. Okay, fine. Does that nullify everything that he wrote? I mean, because if you're going to do that, yeah, then you might as well. Yeah, not only that, though, but I, I still think that it, it basically makes the impression that men wrote the Bible. I mean that it wasn't mm-hmm. you know the Holy Spirit you know inspired like with the men. So I think right there there's something really big going on with that because again most people look at it and say well they're really ignorant back then they didn't really understand our world. We're so much technologically scientifically advanced you know we're so much smarter than those dumb you know people back then and that's that whole evolutionary lie that we came from Neanderthals and that we evolved and we progressed and we got better and better and smarter. The reality is if you actually start looking into it we're actually getting dumber. You know yeah, our technology right. might be advancing but we're not getting smarter at all. But I think there's a big lie within that, and Satan really wanted to hide the fact and really pound that into people. The fact is, they were dumb back then. I mean, it's okay. No, 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 we'll let that pass. You know, the Bible's good for a crutch, and it's good to make you feel good. And you have your Christianity, have your religion, but don't bring that into the science classroom. Well, you know, you hear this all the time from the scientists, but, but, but again, they all look at it like it's men. It's just a mere book written by a bunch of men. But you brought up the extraordinary fact of 40 authors over 1,400 years. These people, these guys never knew each other. They have a central theme. I mean, the Bible is miraculous. It's incredible. But it is not just written by man. It is God writing the Bible through men, and that's the key. Yeah, and he it's never it. changed his narrative. You know, as, as he's inspiring yeah. men to write, he never... Uh, adjusted the cosmology over time, you know. Uh, even with the, I mean, if we're talking 1,500 years, there's still a lot of advancements and things that took place in humanity in that time, but he never once deviated from the central narrative of the cosmological worldview of a snow globe. It just, it never changed. So then you have to come up with all kinds of crazy ideas like the uh, doctrine of accom- accommodation. Have you heard about that one? Yeah. What do you think yeah, about yeah. that? 
the, well, no, the, so, I, I, but I think it's a cop out. I mean, I, I don't, I don't agree with it at all. And furthermore, you're talking about, you know, that cosmology creation was never changed. I mean, you have the Messiah and Jesus coming to Earth. He had all this time with the disciples. He could have clearly said, "Guys, guys, whoa, 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 okay, you had something <laughs> wrong," you know. But he never ever does. He never corrects them in their cosmo in their cosmology. And all the Hebrew com- cosmology was clearly, like you're explaining, a snow globe. Right? It seems crazy, but again, remember that the flat Earth is the furthest end of the spectrum. It's almost like if you were going to be, you know, uh, indoctrinated in something so hardcore, this is probably. You know, I was joking with a friend one time, and I said, "You have to understand the people, the, the way people look at what we're talking about. We've literally hit the stupid mother load. In the, as far as how dumb can someone be to believe that you're on a flat Earth? So it's been programmed into people to think that is the furthest end of the spectrum. Like try, try to think of something more crazier." than believing that you live on a flat earth. I mean, try it. I mean, people will, will take you a little bit more serious if you believe that the world's run by lizard men. You, oh, you know what? You might be onto something there. You know Yeah. <laughs> but you start saying flat earth, people just lose their mind, right? So again, it's kind of the furthest end of the spectrum. But you're right. I mean, the cosmology, everything is lined there. It is a massive deception. But again, Satan is the god of this world. And he blinds you know, people that cannot see. And to me, it is ingenious in the sense, not giving Satan credit, but the fact is, in order to completely hide God from the creation or try his best to, you know, you start a whole entire origin story that completely has no need for God. I mean, one of the quotes in, the, uh, uh, in Scientism Exposed is, you know, science makes God unnecessary. And again, that, right. there's something yeah. very key about that. There's, it's Carl Sagan. But again, it's, it's very, right. very telling. Hold that thought. We're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba, and tonight I'm talking with my guests, Robbie Davidson and Brian Mullen. We're talking about their new film, Scientism Exposed. And yeah, uh, Robbie, right before the break, you're talking about, you know, what, what better plan of the enemy than to set up something like this to totally discredit God? And it's so outrageous to be talking about this in the 21st century that, you know, the very, just the very mention of the phrase flat earth Everybody thinks it's, you've just completely gone off the deep end. You have got to be this, the most ignorant moron on earth to even consider that. I mean, that's a pretty brilliant strategy. Yeah, I mean, I think those two words, too, like you mentioned before, you want to see the inner cycle go out, you know, go on. Someone just <laughs> mentioned those two words. I don't even call myself a flat earther. I call myself the unenclosed creationist. Right. And usually when I start telling people I'm an enclosed creation, oh, what's that? And I start explaining it. But if you actually start dialoguing with something without mentioning those two words, you'd be surprised what happens. Case in point, scientism exposed. Here you come out with something that you don't mention those two words. Uh, nobody in the film mentions it. I think there's one clip I think that was used from uh, uh, that uh, thing on Netflix or whatever where they talked about in the ancients they believed in a in a flat Earth or a snow globe. Uh, but other than that, it's not mentioned. It's not told people. You know, this is what you need to believe or what not to believe. It just gets people seriously questioning about the fact of you know whether it's geocentricity versus heliocentricity. And again, going back to the Bible. Um, you've got stuff where they'll say, well, it's poetry, like in Psalms, but then what do people do when it comes to, like, Joshua 10, you know, when it comes to, you know, verses that are historical? Uh, that's where, you know, a lot of Christians will start wiggling around and, oh, well, you know, that was their way of looking at it, but it, clearly it says that commanded the sun and the moon to stop. And furthermore, they actually stop over two different locations, you know. Specific so again, locations. How does that work? And, 
Yeah, yeah, specific, completely. Yeah. So again, there's. I mean, you can't just brush this off. And I mean, as Kevin Johnson said, you know, uh, throughout the film, you know, it, it's playing with the word of God really loosely. Like, so you can't play loosely with the word of God, and it, you can't just relegate it to a history book or it's a science book or it's a. I mean, it's the word of God. This is beyond just even literature. And I mean, to actually just go in and say, well, that's allegory and that's poetry and that that's man kind of you know interpreting. And like you said, if you let the text speak clearly and this whole idea that you need to go off to seminary or you need to be a bible scholar to fully understand the bible completely slaps you know everything towards what it's been created for to speak for god to speak to man and you know again how would a child because it says in order to get to heaven you have to come as a faith like a child if a child was reading these texts would they have a clue, you know? And all these, all this time, when all of a sudden, you know, we didn't know about the Big Bang heliocentric universe, how are people formulating this? And it would be cruel, you know, for a creator to be toying around and playing with it just because he feels that, uh, well, creation's not that smart to understand it. Romans 1's very clear. It's very clear and easy to understand that God created the world. So Satan would do everything in his power, in my opinion, to muddy it, to confuse people, to twist it, to get it to a point where it's really tough now to understand. It's like, well, infinite space, okay, it's ever expanding, and it's like, okay, God's beyond there, and where's heaven? Up and down has completely been erased, you know, on a spinning ball flying through space. Where's up? Where's down? Right? Just simple mm-hmm. things like directional studies in the Bible clearly think, and most, most people will say, well, where's hell? And people will point down. But, yeah. you know, and then you'll say to your child, you're like, Daddy, where, where's heaven? It's up. Well, on a spinning ball flying around, you know, the heavens, you know, where is up, you know? So, again, I think it's just a lot of confusion, very simplistic things that God put in, just like his laws, just like his orders, just like everything that was instituted, Satan has gone to attack each one of those to comp- make them more, you know, complex, you know? And, again, it doesn't take away the majesty of God. Some people will say, well, you're taking away this endless billions and billions of planets, and that just shows, like, what a grand creator. You're minimizing his greatness and his majesty, and I'm saying, no, I think it's the opposite. I think you're more in awe when you can't even fully understand the creation rather than man telling you 100% they've mapped everything out. Oh, we know how much that planet weighs. We know that distance. We know uh, how much heat comes off of that. We know, you know, where in the Bible does it even say that we need to actually dissect and go into learning about the creation. If you look at all the verses in the Bible, there's not one commandment where it says, I command you to learn everything about my creation and, you know, study it and dissect it and research it, you know, and I think that man in his attempt and curiosity and Satan kind of infiltrating that has made sure to pervert it, to try to hide the the greatness and the simplicity and the authority and credibility of the the Holy Word, the Bible. You know, if, if, NASA is really doing what they say they're doing, then God kind of really needs to repent of the Tower of Babel. (laughs) Because, you know, in the story of the Tower of Babel, Nimrod builds a tower to, quote-unquote, reach into heaven. That's all we get from the biblical canonized text. But in the extra-biblical text that, that the canonized text actually quotes, for instance, like the book of Joshua, it goes into a tremendous amount of detail elaborating on what his plan was, that his, their plan was to assault heaven and kill God. And modern science has effectively done that, has gone up into the heavens and has killed God. Uh, there's, you know, Time Magazine, you know, God is dead, you know, right? So, you know, if science is really doing what they say they're doing, then it seems to me God needs to repent to the Tower of Babel. Or yeah, and I mean, science, the Tower of Babel never really, really understood. It. Yeah, and I mean, I never really understood that. It just didn't make sense to me on an endless, you know, ball flying through space and endless galaxies and stuff. It's like, well, what was the, what was the big threat there? You know, building this tower. Uh, you know, it, it never, ever really made sense, that story. Uh, but it does make, you know, a lot more sense when you start looking at it in an enclosed cosmology and you're looking at it from that point of view. So, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm with you there that there's, there's certain things that bring light uh, to the reality. But at the end of the day, whether, you know, uh, and I say to people all the time, they'll, they'll say, well, tell me exactly how the uh, sun and the moon work in your thing. And I'm like, I really don't know how the luminaries fully work. And that's fine. I'm okay with that. And, you know, someone to be able to, you know, look in awe and, you know, I don't think I'll ever be able to fully understand it. So to me, it's like this whole idea that we have to fully map everything out and understand everything or the model. All I know is, do I believe in science or do I believe in scripture? And I'm going to go with scripture. Boy, you know, that, that is what 
ultimately hit me like a ton of bricks. I mean, anybody that followed my work on this knows that for the better part of a year, I was calling myself a synthetic agnostic and not committing. 100%. 100%. I would say, look, I'm 80%, which wasn't good enough for, mo- I mean, most of these people are using clips for my videos for their flat earth videos, but they're upset with me because I'm only 80%. I'm like, I'm 80%. <laughs> I'm, I'm, that's 30% over on your side of the fence. You know, give me a break. But my, my hang up with it was, you know, it's, it's, Paul says to prove all things. And so I was really hung up on the luminaries really trying to figure out, okay, what in the world is going on with the sun and moon, especially the, the alleged 24-hour sun in Antarctica, which no flat Earth model yet that I've seen has fully addressed this issue. But it's sort of taking, it, it's sort of moving the goalpost because the question is the shape of the Earth. And all of a sudden, everybody wants to deflect to the luminaries. Well, the, the, you know, this is doing that and that's doing, well, okay, but what's the shape of the Earth? I mean, why can we see Chicago you know, from the other side of Lake Michigan. Why can we do this? Why, why does every test we do on Earth show, A, it's not moving, and B, it's flat? You know, um, but what it came down to for me, and I even put this in a presentation I did called The Genesis Revelation Part 1. In the end of that video, I said, science or the Bible? Science says the universe came from a big bang. The Bible says it all in one universe. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Science says that the stars, including our sun, came first. The Bible says that the sun and stars didn't show up until day four after the earth was created and already producing life. Science describes solar systems with planets going around a fixed sun. The Bible describes an earth-based system with the sun, moon, and stars moving over it. Science says the Earth is spinning at 1,000 miles per hour and orbiting the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. The Bible says in about 67 places that the sun, moon, and stars are moving, but never says anything about the Earth moving. Rather, we consistently find that the Earth is fixed and unmovable, set on a firm foundation of pillars. Science tells us the universe came into being nearly 14 billion years ago and that the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. The Bible tells us it all began less than 6,000 years ago. Science tells us that humans arrived on this earth, as Ken Hovind would say, from goo to you by way of the zoo. The Bible says that we were divinely created in the image and likeness of Yahuwah. Science tells us we are on a spinning heliocentric globe in an average galaxy among billions of galaxies in an ever-expanding universe. But the Bible tells us that we are on a still flat earth that was inscribed as a circle into something with four corners, set on pillars, under a dome, within which the sun, moon, and stars are placed on day four of creation. So who should we believe, science or the Bible? Now, I did that presentation. I got into flat earth in April of 2015. And did this presentation in January of uh, this year. And God was working on me with that question the whole time I was saying I'm a Zetetic agnostic. Okay, you're going to believe science or the Bible? I'm like, well, God, I can't figure out what's going on with the sun. You know, <laughs> and he's like, are you going to believe me or not? That's what it came down to. After the Chicago trip, I got smacked down hard, man. I just got slammed. And he's like, look, do you believe me or not? Bottom line, yes or no? And uh, finally, I just had to give up and say, you know what? Your word has never, ever failed me. I still don't know what's going on with that other 20% that has me hung up, but I, I'm going to believe you. I call myself a biblical earther now, although I like your phrase, an enclosed creationist. <laughs> but yeah, I really the bottom line is, which is true. Questions. Sorry? No, it, it gets people, uh, you know, asking questions. Like, they just get intrigued when they hear, like, oh, close creations. What, what, what's that about, right? So, anyways, it's just a term I came up with, and the whole idea why scientism exposed was to come up with something that really wouldn't turn people off at first glance. I mean, you know, it doesn't have anything religious in the title. It doesn't have anything flat earth in the title. It's talking about scientism. Well, I've heard about science. What's a scientism, right? So now they go on this journey and kind of find out that, well, okay, there's two kind of, you know, there's this whole dichotomy going on between science and scientism and finding out that, uh, you know, there's a lot of lies. But really when it comes down and you were explaining about, you know, just kind of when are you going to be 100%, when are you going to pull the, you know, again, it's faith, right? And, and it, what yeah. pleases God is faith. I mean, and sometimes we have to even, even like, and I'm a lot like you, that I like to, I like apologetics, I like to find out the, the truth in matters, and I like to, but there's that element that God still requires of us is faith. In faith, you will believe what I've said. And again, do you believe in scripture or do you believe in science? And when I'm saying science, I'm saying scientism, but what I'm saying is really, it, it just comes down to that. It's like, are you going to believe what it says? It clearly says that God did it this way. 
I don't care what science. I mean, I love uh, another quote with uh, Kevin uh, Johnson, what he says. He says, if the Bible said that blue is green, Crayola got it wrong. <laughs> you know, we have to have faith. That it doesn't matter. Everyone says it's blue, but the Bible says it's green, then it's green. But, I mean, he's got these great quotes, but I just, I laugh when he says it, but he's just like, look, he goes, if the Bible says the blue is green, Crayola got it wrong. That's all there is to it. It's the Bible. It's nothing else. Like, we have to be that sure. We have to be that confident. We have to, we have, to have that confidence and that authority just be going, no, we don't even waver. We're, I don't really could care less. That's what the Bible says. But, again, how many of us can say that? Myself, I'm not even fully there yet. I'm getting there. We're probably a lot further on than we were, say, five years ago. But, again, we need to get to that point where we're just like, well, what does the Bible say? Like, on any topic, on any, you know, discussion, what does the Bible say? Because over and over, God is proving to us on our journeys that everything he has said, it's been in there from day one, and shame on us, and, you know, repent, and we'll weep, and, and say, I'm sorry, Lord, for even doubting you for a second, or going with the world, because he warns us about the world's wisdom. He says it's foolishness, right? So we need to look at that and say, God, we have to trust in you. We have to look at what you said versus what the world says. As crazy as it sounds, but I just love it. You know, if the whole world is saying that this color is blue, but the Bible says it's green, you know, it's green. Well, we're going to look it up in the original Hebrew. <laughs> so, so, but one of the arguments I hear all the time is people say, well, the Bible is not a book of science anyway. It's about theological messaging. What do you, how do you respond to that? I, I, they, they'll say that the Bible is not a book of science? I mean, oh, yeah, I, I hear that. that the well, book, if they're either saying well, it's all poetry and it's all allegorical, or the other argument I hear is, well, the Bible's not a book of science, so it's unfair for us to hold it to that standard when it was never meant but, to you know, be that well, way to begin that, with. That, just that alone is scary, shows you how big science is in people's minds. That, that statement yeah. alone should horrify someone just the fact that they would actually bring that in going against the bible well the bible's not this i mean they even say the bible's not something when the bible is reality it is creation it is the beginning it is the end it is the alpha and the omega it is everything you know anything that we go through all of the answers to life it's like you know the basic instructions before leaving earth you know uh, mm-hmm. look at that as like an acronym but really it's the instruction manual for life to sit there and say, well, it's not history, or it's not science, or it's not, it's everything, and everything and beyond. So to me, if anyone ever said that, I would just sit there and say, how can you even bring some man-made, you know, knowledge and start to hit the Bible with it and say, well, that's what, because I mean, we know that science is really knowledge, right? It's a newer term. You go back in time and you find out that science is knowledge. So that's like saying that the Bible's not knowledge, right? What a slap in the face. What is all wisdom comes mm-hmm. from the Lord, Right. So to me, it's like, uh, let's just dissect these words, and you want to get into the original. Again, it's knowledge. And he talks about knowledge falsely so-called. He's talking about knowledge that sets itself up uh, against the Lord. So again, I would sit there and say, you know, what kind of knowledge are you bringing and equating? Maybe the Bible is not of your pseudo-knowledge or your pseudo-science. And again, scientism, hey, I'll agree with that. The Bible is not a book of scientism. You're right, it's not. You know, it's the truth. And scientism has lied to us over and over again, and hopefully people will start waking up to the lies, and they can discover the truth found in the only one. That is the way, the truth, and the life. It's Jesus, Yeshua. Amen. Brian, uh, coming from a scientific background, and now that you're coming into more of a biblical worldview, how would you address that statement that the Bible is not a book of science, it's about theological messaging? Well, (laughs) I'm finding out that... uh... Well, the Bible is does seem to be scientifically accurate, and I mean that's even as Robbie said, I, I feel almost bad saying that because my my entire foundation for everything has been what does science say, and so I always challenge uh, the, the word with science, and uh, you know when people would would say things. Like uh, oh they didn't mean that literally and you know people were telling me about the word of God and they would they would say so they would point out so many things that oh that, that's not literal you know that's 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 more more figurative and uh, you know things in Revelation like stars falling to earth and I'm thinking to myself well you know one star would wipe out the entire earth <laughs> yeah, how can yeah. multiple so, yeah, well, how can multiple stars because I was I was thinking they're suns but then. You know, as, as I started, well, as I took astronomy and started to get into the ideas of, of how stars are formed or suns are formed and how everything's based on gravity and 
you know, even when I first learned about gravity in uh, in my physics courses, I, I started to one of the first things I thought about is okay, gravity says that all masses attract each other, not just things fall towards Earth, which is a, which seems to be a little bit of a misconception. You know, all masses attract each other. I'd look around and say, where is the evidence of horizontal attraction? between masses on Earth because there there are masses all over the place, you know, objects, super massive objects around it, and there's no evidence of any of them attracting each other. And so I already had kind of a, a lot of questions about that. And so uh, taking my, my scientific view and, and looking at the Bible was uh, was really keeping me from it. And so now, now that I'm out, doing experiments myself and, and just looking at, you know, how the way the sun moves and, and the way that things happen in the world and then looking at what the Bible says and saying, whoa, this really is describing what what this creation is, what this reality is. And so it's I'm kind of uh, I'm going through myself I'm, I'm an enormous change here because now the Bible is my foundation, not science anymore. And so it, it's 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 just a, a total mind blow, <laughs> a new reality for me. It, it's beautiful though. I, I love it. And, and now I, as Robbie said, I'll, I'll I'll trust in the word before I trust in science because science being knowledge comes from men. And one thing I know for sure is men lie. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was the thing that, uh, that that God was smacking me down with, and he used the Bill Schnoblin video to do it, and he opened it up, the, the video that he produced uh, while I was in Chicago, uh, and he, he posted it on Facebook. He started out with saying, is God a man that he should lie? And, you know, and he started saying, you know, that, that the scriptures are true and that God esteems his, wor- his word above his own name, which he holds in such high regard. He says he wants his name to be known in all the world, but yet he is esteems his word even higher than that. And, you know, is God a man that he should lie? No, he's not. You know, he's not a liar. So, therefore, his word must be true. And, you know, for, for, from a biblical Christian worldview perspective, it seems to me that the, the trump card in Scripture is the stars. Because it says, you know, Isaiah, Yeshua, Peter, and John – three huge heavy hitters in the scripture, including the son of God himself said that all the stars are going to fall to earth like figs. Uh, and, and if you just read it, there's no indication that they're all of a sudden being poetic in those conversations. You know, so I'm like, okay, well then the stars can't be what we're told they were. Isn't it convenient that they actually made all the stars conveniently in the sun? just to kind of really mm-hmm. throw you off, you know. Again, the whole idea, just even that stars are suns, I mean, it's so clear from Genesis. He created, like, two lights, you know, he goes, says the sun and the moon, and also stars, right? Mm-hmm. So sun is clearly not a star, and a star is not a sun, but it's right there. Like, it's, again, it's in the foundation right there at the heart, you know, start right off in Genesis and start twisting it. And again, like I had mentioned in another interview, if you look at every creation verse, in a literal sense, and look at what scientism is taught, it is the exact opposite. It's not close. It's not kind of, you know, similar. It is 100% the opposite. If it says, you know, we're, we've been around for 6,000 years, they say 6 billion years. Like, they just go completely opposite, and they go into these really wild stretches. But, yeah, I think you're on something, too, with the stars. Because, again, when they started talking about all the stars, they're just suns. And, by the way, we're just a mediocre, you know, planet even i mean there's bigger planets and you know the whole wandering stars you know they used to you know be referred to and now you start looking around they're discovering planets that are like you know 800 times bigger than earth and again it just gives us no significance whatsoever it doesn't make any sense from a biblical standpoint and unfortunately too many people get caught up in this and they start to bring god into this entire you know big bang you know, heliocentric cosmology, and I just think there's a danger in that, because then you start kind of compromising. Well, you know, I believe the Bible is literal here, but this, that has to be allegory, because we know that, you know, there's billions of planets, and um, they're not really mentioned, there's stars. I just think, yeah, it's one by one by one, and it's really not even about the shape of the Earth, and that was scientism exposed, was you don't even have to talk about the shape of the Earth with people. You can sit there and start breaking down scientism and show that it is a complete assault whether it's on the stars, the moon, the sun, whether it's on where we came from, did we come from monkeys, or were we created special and unique, you know, in a, in a literal day sense. Um, these type of things, and again, 
is there really science behind it? Because when you start getting into even the theory of evolution, again, these are theories. They're not 100% conclusive. They've got huge gaps. They don't have missing links. They've got massive chasms that they have not filled. They have never found. But yet they're taught, children are taught this in school, and it does irreparable damage. People, you know, mm-hmm. see this, and they start walking away from the Bible, from God, because, again, it doesn't, it's not even that it doesn't make sense. It's not true. We already know because science has shown us that these guys were ignorant. So why would I depend on people that didn't even understand their entire world, you know, when they tell me about my inter- my eternity, right? They're probably wrong on that, too. So I might as well go on my quest and start, you know, meditating and start becoming one with nature and I might as well worship a tree or, you know what I mean? <laughs> like Gaia worship, let's, you know, Mother Earth, let's all band together and let's help her because we're going to destroy Earth. So, you know, let's really help her because she needs help. I mean, it's nonsense. But again, it says in the Bible, people would turn and serve the creation rather than the creator. And we're seeing that. We're seeing that with like tree huggers and earth worshipers and nature and get in touch. And if you look at the whole new age, you know, idea, it is just all a bunch of gobbledygook that all roads lead, you know, everyone can get to heaven, just do it, whatever you feel. But again, this whole science, you know, again, another thing that the scientism exposed shows that there's a very spirituality behind it because these guys are clearly taking pot shots and they're clearly attacking Jesus. I mean, with these blasphemous mm-hmm. statements they say about the stars exploding, so forget Jesus dying for you, it was the stars. Thank the stars. And again, there's a parallel that I didn't even mention in the film, but if you actually get into Satanism and you get into the writings of Anton LaVey or Aleister Crowley, Aleister Crowley taught that every man and every woman is a star. And you start getting into the stars because you brought up the whole star significance, whether they're lights in the sky, are they terra firma, are they uh, living beings, all these sort of things. But if you start looking on the other side of the spectrum, getting into the writings of Anton LaVey or uh, Aleister Crowley, or you start looking at deep, deep end um, New Age with uh, Blavatsky, and you get into those things. See how they determine the stars. It gets very intriguing how this all connects back to the stars. But who was the morning star, right? Lucifer, right? The star fell, all these sort of things. But again, we're coming right back to where's the origins? Lucifer created us instead of Yahweh. Again, it's very, very tied in. But again, this whole thing, it's just if someone will just open their eyes and see that there's an agenda, there's a deception going on, and it's not just, well, we're just looking at, you know, in our telescopes and looking at the stars. When you start getting into the heart of it, they start talking about you should be thankful because they birthed you. To me, when you start looking at the stars and being thankful that they're your creator rather than God, already, you know, Lucifer basically is winning on all fronts, you know. And it's really sad. So hopefully we can uh, wake people up with the film and even just uh, interviews like this. Where can um, people uh, check out the film Scientism Exposed? Well, they can check it out. It's uh, up on YouTube for free. I wanted to make sure that uh, nothing would hinder people from seeing uh, this uh, documentary film. So it's on free on YouTube. You can go to CelebrateTruth.org. Uh, you can buy the DVD if you want to watch it. And you want to get a DVD afterwards, great. If you want to hand them out, people are buying them to, to hand out to people, to give to certain people that possibly might not go to YouTube and watch a two-hour documentary film. But it's on Facebook as well. Just do a search for Scientism Exposed, and you'll be able to uh, watch it for free pretty much on any platform. And like I said, if you want to support the ministry of Celebrate Truth, um, feel free, buy a DVD. Awesome. Do you have a website for it also? Yeah, it's CelebrateTruth.org. So it's just Celebrate okay. Truth and then .org. Yeah. Okay, so check it out on CelebrateTruth.org, Celebrate Truth on YouTube, and be sure to uh, pick up the DVD to help support their ministry and their work so they can do some more projects just like this. And we'll talk some more about all that when we come back from the break. Frequency Radio. The wicked ones obviously under heavy, heavy, heavy Masonic <laughs> influence. <laughs> back on the 
the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba. For the second hour of the broadcast, I'm talking with my guests, Robbie Davidson and Brian Mullen. We're talking about their recent documentary, Scientism Exposed. And uh, again, just to uh, recap what we were talking about right before the break, people can watch it for free, can't they? Yeah, absolutely. You can watch uh, the entire film for free on YouTube. Uh, it's also uploaded on Facebook. Just do a search for Scientism Exposed. You'll be able to watch for free. We also have the DVD available. Uh, and I want to make sure that when I uh, came out with this that uh, nothing would hinder people from seeing it. So if you don't want to buy a DVD or you can't buy a DVD, don't worry. You can watch the entire thing and just share it. There's many ways you can you can support the ministry of Celebrate Truth prayerfully, you know, just sharing, getting the word out there, and uh, also picking up a DVD because this will really uh, be a huge, huge um, tool in uh, fighting against uh, the lies of scientism and taking down the spiritual deception and agenda. And uh, we were talking a little bit uh, off air before we started the broadcast. Uh, you guys are up on IMDb also, aren't you? Yeah, it's uh, on uh, IMDb, uh, Internet Movie Database. And uh, right now it's uh, about 9.5 out of 10. It's got about 200 ratings so far. It's doing absolutely phenomenal. The feedback has been just absolutely incredible. People are reaching out to me that aren't even, you know, close creationists or flat earthers. Uh, there's people that are reaching out from different podcasts, uh, networks. Um, it has been absolutely extraordinary just getting people thinking and that message. And it seems to me that, uh, you know, it came at a really good time. The message is hitting well and just excited to see what the Lord has in store uh, for uh, the ministry, but also the film and just everyone that's involved. Excellent. Brian, how have uh, your peers responded to uh, your participation in a video like this? Uh, well, it's, I haven't really had too much feedback. Um, uh, the engineers I work with right now are all believers. So they, they aren't, um, they definitely think uh, <laughs> flat, the, by the flat earth ideas are a stretch, but uh um, I haven't really received too much from anyone, Not, nothing negative, but uh, I'm waiting. Uh, some people haven't gotten around to watching it yet. It's only been out for a week, so uh, we'll see how it goes. Only been out for a week, and how many views have you got so far on YouTube, Robbie? Yeah, it's almost 35,000 views. Wow, that's good. That's real good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been, and, it's been really phenomenal, and the reviews are just extraordinary. Like People are just... Uh, raving about it thinking it's just uh, absolutely such a great message and uh, yeah i'm really really excited about it so after doing the global lie i mean obviously there's a lot that you kind of open up a whole bunch of can of worms in that video and what was it that made you say okay the next one i got to do is scientism exposed uh, I just felt that uh, there was a lot. There was some really amazing research uh, that was being done out there, and uh, rather than just you know do another uh, thing on all the in-depth research, come out with something that basically could reach out to a wide audience that could span even past religious audiences, even into people that are questioning just what they've been told. They want to watch a good documentary film. So me, it was really important to throw something out there that literally those two words were not mentioned: flat Earth. Uh, but also, you know, not hiding away from it, just getting people to question, is it possible they've lied to us about the earth? You know, somebody watching that that's like, wait a minute, I really think something's going on. They're going to go and do their little search. They're going to find out, you know, what, what's going on here. They're going to find out what people are saying. They'll come across, you know, great stuff like yours, Rob, and they'll come across a lot of different people that have done really amazing research. Uh, and then they can go on their own journey, because really this is all about a journey for truth, and we're all hungry to know the truth. We want to know, you know, everything, anything that's been taught to us, and it possibly could be a lie. And there's a lot of people that really maybe the other stuff is way out there. They might still be holding on to the evolution. They might really honestly believe that they evolved from apes. Uh, that alone was important to put that in there, not just to hit right into cosmology, but just to start. And even especially with a lot of Christians that are already tracking, saying, yep, yep, we agree, evolution, that's been a lie. Yep, yep. And then start hitting them with like, whoa, never really thought about the stars. You know, yeah, uh, they can't be sons. Well, then if they lied about that, did they lie about something else? And then away they go, this domino effect where it's like, well, if they lied about that, what else are they lying about? So sometimes we like to hit people with, like, say, the moon landing, where it's like, whoa, that's just that's a huge conspiracy or a huge lie. But you start just throwing these things out, these small little 
and people start going, well, wait a minute. So that was my approach was it was to throw things out just to get people questioning, not to tell them what to think or what's truth, to sit there and say, really? You know, are you really going to believe in this? Are you sure? Are you sure that you know what you know? Are you sure you're believing in science? Or are you believing in scientism? Because if you're believing in scientism, uh-oh, we got a problem, you know, not to mention there could be something sinister behind it, but really you have a big problem if this has never been science after all, because most people believe that it's, you know, gone through the scientific method. Scientists discover, so therefore it, it exists, right? You, how often do we hear that every day, right? Scientists mm-hmm. just discovered, you know, uh, Kepler, mm-hmm. and uh, there's 18,000 new planets. They discovered that habit life. Yay! You know, no one questions it. They just say scientists discovered it. Now, and uh, Brian, Brian could talk a little bit about this because he talked quite a bit uh, about this, uh, even in the interview footage going into, you just get to that point where it's like, well, who are these scientists? You know, you don't even see these names that the scientists discovered. Or, you know, you know, nine out of ten scientists agree. Well, what were the nine? <laughs> you know, who was the one that disagreed? Can I, can I talk to you? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Oh, oh yeah, that's uh that's, that's one of the things I've I've seen time and time again. It's just it's a, a whole bunch of scientists did this and so it's like, oh okay, it must be true. They're uh I mean they they're they're really smart, they're they're all you know, they have college degrees, they have PhDs, I mean who who are they? Who are they? what are their names? I mean a lot of articles don't even really get into that and it's just like, Oh well they said it it must be true, and people, unfortunately, I mean, don't realize they start to really worship them, and it's, it's very sad when nobody's doing any uh, any any fact checking, any experiments for themselves, and uh, I mean, it's just it's it's really gotten out of hand. That you know what you just said, nobody's doing experiments for themselves is is so true. Um, I'm not going to mention his name, but uh, a colleague and friend of mine who I've done shows with before is still not at all on this Flat Earth page. And he's like, you know, scientists have already proven it. Scientists have already done this. And real science, they've already done all this research. So, you know, so why should I take your research, Rob, over theirs? Because they're so qualified, right? They, they're they specialized in all these fields, and what are you? you? You know, who are you? You've never even been to college, you know? In other words, Rob, you're an idiot, so why should I believe you? Even though you're out there trying to do tests for yourself, I'm going to believe that nine out of dentist, you know, nine out of ten dentists surveyed, you know, <laughs> scientists, whatever. Or the other argument is, well, you know, my friend's a Christian scientist, and my friend's a Christian astronaut, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm going, well... Okay, clearly Christians are deceived about a great many things, and you know that as well as I do. We could go down a laundry list of things that Christians have been deceived about. And so is it possible that a scientist who happens to be a Christian could also be deceived? Or an astronaut? Or some dude at NASA? That I mean, NASA is such a huge organization, but yet when you look at the worldwide statistics, only about 550 human beings out of 7.5 billion – have ever allegedly even been to space. So uh, is it really that big a conspiracy? I mean, does a chef have any idea what the king's doing or why? No. It, this, the mechanic that's building parts for stuff that's going to launch up on a launch pad to go who knows where doesn't know anything except that they're making parts. So I think it's real important for the do the test yourself side of things. And you know, obviously we don't have all the money and resources some of these agencies have, so we can't do all the tests that they can do for ourselves. But there are tests that we can do for ourselves, and at least from my perspective, on my limited resources, the tests that I've been doing come up flat. Yeah, and this, you know, it's it's funny. There's uh, you know, there's 535 members of Congress, and a lot of people would agree that we can't really trust them. So, uh, um, you know, 550 people. That's not that's not a lot of people to be in on something like this, or to I mean, maybe be deceived, as you said. And uh, one, one thing I wanted to bring up earlier, when you say about uh, you mentioned doing tests, um, your average person cannot go outside with a telescope, uh, getting back into stars, and look at look at the stars with a telescope and find evidence that they're thousands of light years away and that they're sun. I mean, there's no way you can do that. And really, one of the first things I discovered is when you go out with a telescope and focus it on one star and you, you set your focus on that star with your telescope and move to any other star in the sky, it's in focus. But 
you know, if you take a pair of binoculars out and look at something in the distance that's mm-hmm. a mile away and then look at something else that's three miles away, you have to adjust the focus because it's farther away. Uh, your mm-hmm. second object's farther away. And then the excuse, there is an excuse for that, that you know, the, the stars are projecting their image on the atmosphere of the Earth, and that's why they all look like they're the same distance away. But you can't conclude that they're suns and that they're, that, that, that they're far away from just looking at them. And so the, the, these tests, we, people need to do, you know, we need to do them together. And, and, and people, knowing someone that's doing tests is starting to seem more legitimate to me than scientists that we don't know. Like you mentioned your friend, he knows who you are. He doesn't know who those nine out of ten scientists are. He has no idea who they are. He doesn't know if they're trustworthy people. He doesn't know if they're making money for saying what they're saying or if they're following some type of agenda. <laughs> So, I still want to talk to the are, one guy that disagrees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would like to talk to that guy, too. <laughs> you know, who's that guy? Yeah, you make well, a point. You made... right? And again, I, I could touch more on, on scientism exposed because, again, there's a lot of this the science is settled. I mean, getting into climate change or getting into vaccinations or getting into mm-hmm. – a lot of this stuff is the science is settled. You know, there's no debate, you know. Don't your conspiracy theorist or whatever, but again, there's a lot of danger uh, getting into even other areas of scientism that we haven't even talked about. But again, this all comes back to this whole thing. Is it science or is it scientism? Mm. Yeah, uh, you, you made a point earlier about all the other sciences that have lied to us. I mean, it Anybody who's followed some decent Christian apologetics ministries, people like Kent Hovind's ministries and others, that show all the problems, you know, Nebraska Man, Peking Man, all these different uh, documented hoaxes that even the evolutionists have acknowledged now, saying, yeah, we know that that's a stain in our history, that, you know, there were scientists who did lie to try to prove the, you know, biology, evolu- biological evolution and whatnot. So we know for a fact that they have lied repeatedly to us or withheld information or skewed information in biology. We know the same thing about geology, that they can test rocks and get 15 different uh, dating results, but they'll always pick the one closest to their preconceived idea of 4.5 billion years old for the Earth. So, you know, we know that they lied to us or give us inaccurate information in geology. And we can go through all the ologies, but all of a sudden when you get to cosmology – Everybody's like, nope, that one's that one's perfect. They've never lied well, to us. That's the point. That's the point, though. Evolution was the scapegoat. I, I think there was a. It was purposely designed that basically some hoaxes, some really inaccuracies would be found in there because the majority. I, I want to say the majority of the church, you know, look at it as a hoax. Look at it as a blatant lie. Uh, they've seen the scientific evidence to support the fact that it can't be true. But again, it's almost like the scapegoat. It's almost like they wanted someone to be found. They wanted Darwin to be the, you know, the fall guy. Let, let, let everyone come against Darwin, but nobody go against Copernicus, right? No right, one goes right. against Kepler, no one go. So again, it was, to me, it, it, it's set up that way on purpose because if you're going to hide a massive deception, it's too risky to have the whole thing. It's very easy, though, to basically get everyone focused on one area. I mean, the media does it all the time, right? I mean, they'll get everyone's attention on, you know, what, what hair color that Britney Spears got her hair color, you know? And we're like, ooh, you know, and something crazy is going on, but they're hiding it. So they're really focused on one thing. Well, I think evolution was kind of that kind of way because it seems like too many people caught that too fast. And it's like, and they just focused all their attention. And I mean, there's some brilliant, brilliant work done by amazing creation ministries. And I have nothing but respect uh, in ways for all of that end of things. And that's why I included uh, stuff in the film, you know, with Kent Hovind you were mentioning. He was instrumental. He was a huge inspiration to me early on, um, helping me to fight the lies of scientism when it came to evolution and use his materials. And he did amazing seminars. He came to my church like 20 years ago, and I just got to talk to him and just run through it. And that guy, I mean, he was funny. He was great. And he'll go down regardless in history. Those seminars will live on for generations. They're on YouTube. They're mm-hmm. translated in almost every language of the world. They've done an incredible job. I just think now we're moving into a new phase where there's going to be a new set of people that are going to focus on other areas of scientism, and they're going to do an incredible job, and they're going to expose lies that until you know recently they really have not been looked at because the focus is all open on the biological sciences. You know, let's focus mm-hmm. on the biology, you know, because that affects me. You're affecting mm-hmm. me and my self-worth, and you're telling me where I came from. But no one, no one looked back further than just the beginning of evolution and dinosaurs. It's like, well, wait a minute. Let's go back further. Let's go into this Big Bang. And again, I've said this in many, many interviews and even in videos, and I did this personally myself. 
you know, someone would believe in the Big Bang. I'm like, you believe nothing, you know, you know, created everything. And I'm saying God did it, right? So I just attached God to it, and that was it. I never even had to look into it because, haha, I won. You know, you say nothing, I say God. Therefore, who's mm-hmm. stupid, right? You're saying nothing, and I'm saying a creator. But again, once I did that, I never really looked into it because I just stopped and just said, God created the bang. He spoke everything into existence, bang, right? But I used the whole Big Bang cosmology as the bang speaking everything into it. So that was, to me, when I started looking into everything, I'm like, wow, I did a really disservice when I attached the entire heliocentric Big Bang you know, cosmology to God creating everything. And like you mentioned even before, when you started doing those parallels between everything that's the opposite, you know, the sun, moon, and stars came after the Earth. That's a complete contradiction to the Big Bang cosmology. There is no Earth before the sun, moon, and stars. You know, like, again, it basically was the sun. The suns were created before Earths or planets, right? So you just can't have both worlds, and that's the whole thing is, you know, as people that are going to be serious about Scripture, we have to, in faith, say, God, you did it this way. Don't care what anyone says. It was done this way. Even if the whole world laughs at me and thinks I'm a moron, you know what? I'll be a moron for you. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, uh, evolution is, is, is completely tied to the Big Bang, infinitely expanding universe, heliocentric model. Because it, 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 I mean, it's really about where we came from, and for evolution to hold any water, you have to have that model, or it just all falls apart. So it's all interconnected, and, and that's, that's really uh, that's discussed in scientists exposed. It, it's really shown that that's all linked together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. what amazes me about some of these other uh, apologetics type ministries is you know, like Kent Hovind's response to this. Again, I love Kent Hovind too. He had a profound mm-hmm. impact on my life growing up, came to my Baptist church when I was a kid. And like I said earlier, I've got all his materials, love his stuff. But when this fir- this topic first came out, Flat Earth, he's like, look, guys, we've all seen the pictures in the textbook. It's a globe. Get over it. you know." And we're like, uh you mean the same textbooks you spent your entire life refuting, telling us that you can't mm-hmm. trust? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, why, why do we, why, why are we so quick to embrace that all the other ologies of science have lied to us about a great many things, but this is the untouchable, the ball. It's a good question. It's a really good question. Mm-hmm. I think it's a very deep question. And I think we need to like really think about that because there's something telling about the fact that nobody questions the other forms of science they just hit the biological but if you even bring up anything to do with astronomy or you bring up psychology or you bring oh yeah you know that's that's proven I mean, we just know that right and especially and mm-hmm. i think the biggest reason i'm going to go out here and say this the biggest thing especially around you know christian circles what about those good christian astronauts they couldn't possibly be liars could they i mean i'll get approached people will come up to me and they're like so you're telling me they're liars? And I'm like, they're trying to corner me with this, right? But really, yeah. I think the whole idea is I think that's really helped. Now, if I'm the devil, I mean, it doesn't take two and two to be like, hey, I just need a couple people. I mean, look at politicians. They quote scriptures and they talk the big talk, but they're not. I mean, that's like saying that Obama was Christian. I mean, what, what nonsense, right? Mm-hmm. Just because mm-hmm. he quotes some scripture? I mean, he said some disgusting, blasphemous things. And yet, I, I mean, I forget what the percentage of evangelical Christians voted for Obama. It was absolutely incredibly high. But that's the whole reality is just because someone speaks it. I mean, how many wolves in sheep clothing have preached from pulpits? I'm sure it's happened mm-hmm. lots, right? But again, this whole idea that an astronaut, a Christian astronaut that, that preaches the gospel or that does this or goes to this church or whatever, possibly, oh my goodness, no, you know? And then we're talking like a handful. We're talking like, I, I can't even count on one hand how many Christian astronauts. That's how small this number is, but yet almost every Christian that I've talked to that hit me with the whole NASA thing, or clearly they're up in the ISS taking pictures. You know, you got Jeff Williams is one of the big, big names that gets floated around. No, he couldn't be a liar. You tell, he's a good Christian man. How dare you? You know, you can't. I can, I can say whatever I want. I think he's lying. I don't believe mm-hmm. he's telling the truth because Scripture says he is wrong, right? <clears throat> so I don't really care what somebody says. Uh, and maybe it comes off as being, you know, judgmental or whatever. I'm not being judging or anything. I'm just saying that I have a really hard time with this idea that you're just going to embrace everything to do with what NASA says because there's a one good Christian astronaut in the mix. Like, you, you, I mean, you make a was, great point. Five hundred. If there were if there was five hundred, then I might have a little bit more problem with this. But we're talking one or two out of the five hundred yeah, yeah. that went to space. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the other question is, okay, they say they're Christians, but are they a Freemason? 
Like Jim Irwin is a great example. No, I'm not going to sit here and judge. I don't know. That's between him and God. You know, he's, he's gone now. He died a while back, but, um, uh, he came to my church and, um, I have a, a signed autograph picture of him allegedly standing on the moon and it says, uh, go for your dreams, Rob, aim high. And it's, you know, he signed it, Jim Irwin. So, you know, and I wanted to be an astronaut, man. That was my thing growing up. I wanted to be an astronaut. So to have an, a Christian astronaut come and sign a picture of himself on the moon for me was huge, man. I, it's still hanging up in my home office right in front of my face, right above my monitor. But he's a Freemason. He was, he was a Freemason. So I'm going, well, how can you say you're a Christian and yet also be a Freemason. So yeah, can, can the, I mean, we'd be foolish to think that the devil wouldn't plant a few uh, in the church, at least. Yeah. In fact, no, if, you read, sure. uh, no, if, you read sure. CS, if you read C.S. Lewis's uh, book, Screwtape Letters, uh, yeah. that's what it's all, it, it, like the primary objective was to set up shop in the church, <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, and again, I mean, you have Christians out there that are preaching in the pulpit saying that evolution is true, that God used evolution to create man. Right. So just because someone says they're Christian, they can still be wrong, I and mean, they can still be liars, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. uh, this whole idea that we just can never, ever say that someone's a liar or we can't doubt someone because they're Christian, I mean, to me, that is really shaky stuff. If you're going to base your entire cosmology and your entire belief system, you know, on space and on the Big Bang heliocentric thing based on NASA or an astronaut, for goodness sakes, right? Hey, let's get into the dialogue. Tell me how many, you know, I love these articles that these creation ministries are writing. It's like answers in Genesis. No answers from Genesis. You know, right. They would do a whole <laughs> article, know. and there's not one verse in there. I'm like, are you kidding me? So uh, when I had this discussion, yeah. I sit there and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't care about science right now. I care about scripture. Let's go. All right? You give me mm-hmm. all your verses to support the heliocentric Big Bang universe. I'm going to give you all the verses to support. So regardless, whether you want to say they're all poetry, I've still got a ton more than you've got. You've got nothing. You've got Isaiah 4022, which you can't even use because you said everything else is allegory and poetry, poetic. So you can't even use that. So the whole idea that they're going to pick and choose when they can use something, because everyone loves to use Isaiah 4022. I did myself. And what did we do? That was literal. That's literal, wasn't it? It was 100% literal. That's the globe. That's the spinning ball, right? But again, well, wait a minute. I thought you just said that, you know, that was allegory or that's poetry. Or, you know, if they pick a verse, and there's another one, that one that it hangs, you know, on nothing. Or, you know, yeah, you've yeah, addressed this, Rob, before. But again, yeah. that's really weak. And then we've got, like, you know, how many... So like it or not, is what I'm hearing, is we've got, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 verses to support, even if it's a theory. The fact is, we've got all of this biblical scripture support. What on the other side they have? They've got like one verse, and they've got all the science they're going to hit you with. And it's like, listen, we're in this because we are very skeptical of what science has taught us. You and will agree with evolution, right? Do you believe that's a conspiracy? Do you believe that there's a cover-up been going on, that people have actually deceived people? Well, well yes. Then why are you calling me a conspiracy theorist if I'm if I'm questioning NASA or I'm questioning you know um, astronomy you know but it's so funny it's like a double standard all these you know people will sit there and say well yeah clearly evolution there's a conspiracy going on people have you know you know well wait a minute there's a lot of people in on this isn't there but here's the reality and this is very very simple the reality is this nobody has to be on a big big conspiracy they just have to believe what they were taught from someone else their dad taught them and then they taught their son and their son taught again a lot of this stuff is we were taught i mean brian talks about this all the time but it's not like you did all the experiments you were taught from your professors the, you know then the, the students went on and taught that so we we get this carried down we don't debate it this is the way gravity works no one sits there and goes excuse me um you know i'm going to question the gravity and prove to me gravity is real no they say interesting intriguing and then they do all these formulas and away you go but no one stops and says wait a minute what if i don't agree with gravity you just get laughed at and told that mm-hmm. you know what i mean you need to time out because you know i don't know if you should be in this class because you're not thinking straight you know nobody questions gravity of course it's real so it's this ridicule, this name calling. You got Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, trying to prove gravity by dropping mics on a stage. I mean, these are the scientists. These are the big chosen leaders to to educate the world and to get into serious dialogue. And they're dropping a mic on the stage to say there's gravity and then use an explicit word. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy, and people can't see this. It's like something's going on when they won't even address this seriously. They'll just like, oh, oh you're a moron. Of course, we've no imagined. What are you going to fall off the edge of the earth? So again, this is all programmed. To basically, if you even question these things, you're an idiot. 
And again, who wants to be made feel like an idiot? All, all of us that are on the show tonight, we are taking a step of faith. We're stepping out, and we know that people are going to laugh at us. People are going to ridicule us. and they're going to. But again, what does the Bible state that if you're a true disciple and you truly are representing, the world is going to laugh, it's going to mock, it's going to, you know. Again, that's part of actually even being a follower of Christ is the fact that the world will not accept us. So it's not just the cosmology. It's taking a stand truly for the Bible, you know, for the Savior, the Messiah, all of these things all come into fact. And then when you look at the whole science world, like you were mentioning, Brian, is really the one number one attack is the Bible, right? Is Jesus. I mean, this is just Christianity just gets dragged right through the mud. I mean, I was mentioning this on a show the other night. I was saying, if you notice these scientists, they're not taking pot shots at Buddha. They're not talking, you know, about how crazy it is to believe that God is in all. They're just saying the stars created you. But again, they'll sit there and they'll laugh and they'll mock Jesus and they'll bring all of these things to focus and again it's time that we stand up and, and I mean it's time that we're not completely insulted and open up the fact that there is something deeper going on and that this has really blindsided the whole world because everyone formulates their entire worldview and also their criticism of the Bible based on what science has taught them. All right, all that thought. We're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba, for the final half-hour segment of the broadcast. I'm talking with my guests, Robbie Davidson and Brian Mullen. And, um, wow, uh, you were on a roll there, uh, Robbie. I don't know if uh, you finished your thought, but I'll let you <laughs> continue. No, I mean, that, that was pretty much it. I mean, I was just uh, – obviously, I get really passionate about this because I mean, each yeah. one of us were incredibly passionate about holding you know, up the Word of God, holding up the truth, and coming and trying to expose the lies, because again, these are eternal consequences. Uh, you know, this isn't just a game. I mean, this is life, and the stakes are really real. And it's important that people at least take the time to look into these claims, not laugh them off or just you know ridicule them or brush them off. Again, these are really, really big you know concepts. So hopefully, people will at least look into it a bit and um, yeah, come up with their own conclusions. But really, at the end of the day, if you're going to seek truth and you really sincerely do. In your heart, um, you know, you can have that peace. But a lot of people, like I said, they've just heard what other people have said, whether it's the Bible, well, it's just a book, or it's been translated, so therefore I'm not going to pay attention to it. But really, is that the truth, you know? Um, that was kind of me in my life for the longest time. I mean, I looked at all these things. I looked at Noah's Ark is ridiculous. I mean, I used to I used to laugh at Christians that believed in the fact that there was an ark and all these animals were on this boat. I mean, how ridiculous is that? But the fact is, when you start looking in to how it's, you know, set out, the dimensions of the boat, just everything. You're like, my goodness, right? And then not to mention that every civilization around the world, you know, have an account of a flood story, you know, whether it's Asia or you look around the world, they all talk about a flood story. Um, You know, so again, these things, when you start actually looking into it, you're like, wait a minute, you know, there's something going on here. And they have really worked on hard. I mean, even the dinosaur thing. I mean, you you see drawings all around the world of dragons, you know, man fighting dragons. What if man existed with dinosaurs? You know, mm-hmm. the Bible clearly talks about that. And again, but science will tell you, no, 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 they were millions of years ago. Well, wait a minute. You know, it says in the Bible that death brought upon, you know, sin. Therefore, you know, in their story, they just destroy the whole scenario of a redeemer. There is no need for a redeemer because sin didn't affect the world. Death was already in the world before man was here. So again, it's an assault on the entire redemptive story of the creator and it gets layers deep and hopefully people will wake up to start looking into seeing how deep this really goes. You know, uh, I was watching 
Star Trek Enterprise. I, I'm a Star Trek fan. I admit it. I'm a I'm a Trekkie uh, or Trekker, depending on how you <laughs> you look at it. But whatever. I'm watching this episode called North. I think it was the episode called North Star, which was um, season three, episode nine, I believe. It aired November twelfth, two thousand three. And toward the end of it, they bring one of the settlers of this planet up onto the ship to show them, you know, that they live on a planet. And there's the shot that they show of the planet, and I'm going to have to do a screenshot of this and, and check it for myself because it looks almost identical to one of the pictures allegedly taken on the ISS. Um, and it's a pretty famous one. It's the one where the sun's just out of the top of the frame. You can sort of just see like a little bit of a lens flare of the sun up at the top of the frame, and you got this perfect curved Earth in the in the in the background there, uh, and the sun is like reflecting on the ocean, and the cloud. I mean, it's actually a beautiful picture, uh, but in one of the shots, you can see the camera that he used to take that picture, and in Photoshop, uh, there's some filters that allow you to correct for barrel distortion if you know the camera and the lens that was used so if you punch in the camera and the lens that he said he used to take that picture and you hit the filter to correct for barrel distortion it ends up being flat that's the desktop i uh background that i have on my laptop i have the flattened version from the filter of photoshop being applied to it but it looks i mean that's why it caught my eye it's because i see it all the time as a desktop on my my laptop but here i'm watching star trek and it looks like the same picture is being used in 2003 as a cgi effect you know it, to show a planet and so i'm going okay wait a minute is this uh, do we have a situation of life imitating art or is art just being used to create the fantasy of what we think is life <laughs> i don't know but you know i'm looking at everything a lot differently than i did before are you guys finding the same thing now that your eyes have sort of sort of been open to this are you seeing things a lot differently now when you look around? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you mentioned that uh, um, you, said, you said the the, astronaut, the Christian astronaut took that, that photo, and uh, one thing I've been thinking about, uh, back it up a little bit, but uh, we, you know, you, we're told in the Bible that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. I don't think it's too mm -hmm. far-fetched to think that one of his followers would disguise himself as a Christian astronaut. And so kind of going on what Robbie said. <coughs> but um, um, another thing I was, I was thinking about when, when you said that is, is, is the original Star Trek came around, came out, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but right around the time that the, the moon landings were about to happen. Wasn't it in the... the it was the before, yeah. Was, yeah, that yeah. was exactly my thought as I'm going back and watching these shows that we all grew up with. Uh, but now I'm looking at them with sort of different eyes. And I was just thinking about that because Star Trek Enterprise is the prequel before the Captain Kirk series, right? So, but I'm thinking about the time period of when the, the Captain Kirk series was, and that was all leading up to the time of the moon landing. So I'm going, wait a minute, were they just perfecting the look of space and the creation of planets? You know, <laughs> I mean, it had three years yep. to do it. Yeah, uh, 2001, a space odyssey. And space odyssey just knocked it out of the park, I and mean, that's right before the moon landing. Also, of course, there's the whole conspiracy that you know, whether or not Kubrick was involved with what we saw for for the moon footage. Uh, I mean, it's not beyond. You know, if we want to go ahead and put a conspiracy hat on, it's not beyond plausibility that that's exactly what they could have done. Very easily course, too, yeah. and 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 you know, if it, Star Trek Enterprise was from like uh, 2001 to 2004, I think is when it aired. Uh, and the special effects in that series are fantastic and indistinguishable. In fact, I would say they're better than what we're seeing from alleged footage from ISS or <laughs> from <laughs> from NASA. And, and I've and Star Trek Enterprise had a, I think it was a 1.5 to 2 million dollar budget per episode and how much does wow. nasa get to play with every year something like 24 yeah. billion, <laughs> billion yeah. so, so how uh, easy would it be for i mean one organization really has the monopoly you know on this yeah. yes there are other space or, or, uh, agencies with other governments and stuff like that but uh, from in my mind if they send if they sign the antarctic treaty then in, in, in my mind they could be in on it quote unquote you know 
and how easy would it be to just because the rest of us don't have the ability to do any of those tests for ourselves to cr- cross check anything for ourselves so we're relying on the integrity in this, in this country of an organization that was started by freemasons and occultists <laughs> yeah, I think that's the key, though, is, is NASA. You mentioned the other gentleman that's not on board with you when it comes to enclosed cosmology, but I'll ask this question, though. Does he believe they landed on the moon? I'm finding that there's a correlation between almost yeah. everyone that thinks we're insane. They all believe they landed on the moon. I think that that is kind of the key here when it comes to conspir- conspiracy language. If you can get someone questioning, you can get them open up, crack that little part where I'm like, oh, you know what? Maybe NASA, I'm not so sure anymore. Now it's like they're open. So I've always said that I just think that, you know, from a conspiracy angle, if I'm talking to someone, the moon landing is whether I want to go and start talking about the shape of the earth, I get a sense based where they are on the moon landing. If they're like, of course they landed on the moon, I'm not even opening my mouth anymore. You know, I have to get them almost to that point where they're going to question an agency like NASA before I even move into the fact that everything that they believe is not true about the earth they're standing on. So to me, it's like if you do a study, look around and find out all these people that are just thinking you are insane for believing what you believe and then ask them about the moon. I will almost bet nine times out of ten they will say, well, I would almost go 100%. I can't see someone, you know, not believing the moon landing and saying, yeah, we're still on a globe. You know, I just, I just don't, I don't see it. But uh, I think there's a key to that when it comes to conspiracy circles. So if you're talking to someone that has a hard time even believing that 9-11, there might be some, you know, weird stuff going on, if they believe 100% in the official story the government has said about 9-11, because to me 9-11 was a huge pivotal point for me, but I'm saying I've run into a lot of people, and if they believe 100% it was, you know, the terrorists that hijacked Ford airliners, that it was the official story, everything is in there, good luck trying to tell them that they never landed on the moon. You know, they're just yeah. not ready, so it's almost like you've got to soften them. It's almost like, and again, with the film, that was another big thing. I wanted to put out a movie where it's, it's go, taking people on that journey, but going soft, going Going slow through it, just starting to just probe, starting to ask those questions. Because if I came out with the global lie extreme, you know, and I threw it out there, most people wouldn't even give it a time of day because, you know, it just, you know, it might be all about, you know, saying flat earth, left, right, and center in there. But again, to me, this is what we have to do when we're dialoguing with people, when we're concerned about their eternity, when we're concerned about the fact that they might bought into scientism too much, is we've got to kind of go down that journal, kind of in a, in a sorry, down that journey in a gentle manner. And whether it's conspiracies, we're talking about these topics. Let's start with JFK first. Okay, you're tracking. You're kind of suspicious, right? Where are you in 9-11? Okay, you think that's hogwash. Okay, you're ready. Here we go, right? And then you start going, <laughs> you know, getting into some new topics, right? But it's the same thing when it comes to, you know, the shock value. Uh, I remember for me personally, when I found out that my entire worldview with evolution and stuff was all a lie, I mean, it was a huge moment. I mean, it was a big deal. I mean, it wasn't as big, uh, you know, when it came to the realization that, I mean, a snow globe, that was just pretty much, you know, the biggest thing I can imagine as far as worldview being shaken. But again, it comes down to how do we address this? How do we gradually go along this journey? But it's almost like we're sometimes in such a hurry. We want to just go from JFK right to flat earth, right? And it's like we need to kind of go slowly. And again, that's the way I've explained it because it's a shock to the system. It's a shock to the system for me. And I'm a diehard truther, okay? I'm, I'm into like, I'll look into lizard men or I'll look into anything, right? Yeah, so yeah. for me, it's huge. <laughs> for someone that really doesn't even look into these things, that would even question the government or think that, you know, maybe the God of this world has a bigger hand. It's almost like a lot of Christians feel that Satan is real, but he just possesses people and he's just kind of spiritually just does it. They don't really look at it like he's worked with like very powerful families throughout the ages to control and, you know, he was given dominion. It, it clearly says that in the scripture. And again, it's sometimes hard for people, you know, to look at what that means. But when you start digging and going deeper and realizing that really that verse is very true, the ways of the world are evil. God says, come out, because again, the way the world thinks, the way the world system and the programming and all these sort of things, that's all in place. And definitely Satan's got his agenda. Obviously, God's got his will. And again, uh, it's good to be on the right side. Yeah. Absolutely. Good word there. I was looking up that scripture that Brian was mentioning. Uh, it's Second it's Corinthians eleven fourteen through 15. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So, yeah no big surprise that he could and very likely would. I mean, 
from a military strategic perspective, it would make perfect sense for him to seed so-called ministers of righteousness in the church, in NASA, in all these places that, that, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm a scientist, and I know the world's a globe. And everybody else goes, okay. Just like all the voters, you know, Obama's like, I'm a Christian. I, I've worked in a ministry, mm-hmm. international missions organization mission of missionaries. And, yeah, there was a fair amount of people who voted for Obama. I don't believe your votes matter anyway, but still, I was like, seriously? I mean, oh, and Trump found Jesus on the campaign, tr- campaign trail, too. So, okay, there we go. <laughs> you know, wh- when are we going to wake up? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's just like, again, it's just so incredibly easy uh, to masquerade it. And of course, you're going to, you know, sp- you're going to basically speak these things and act Christian. And again, like I said, I'm not judging any of these guys, but I'm just saying that when it comes down to the reality, it makes sense that you're going to have wolves in sheep's clothing. We're warned about it. They're all over the place. I think that God will give us discernment in the long run to really know what's going on. I just find it highly suspicious when all of a sudden, you know, NASA is sending up, you know, Bible transcriptions for this Christian astronaut to read the Bible from the ISS. And you're kind of like, um, okay, that's just a little <laughs> weird. How come the Quran's not being read? And how come, you know, all I'm saying is, why, you know, it's almost like, Let's say this to America because we know 80% are, you know, they claim to be Christians and this will go over really well. And I mean, think of this. Another thing is when they go up there, they, they start reading Genesis, you know, with the Apollo. Yeah. Right? Apollo and 8, I think, I think it was the, Apollo you know, 8. And again, as a Christian, yeah, I mean, as a Christian, if you're sitting there listening to it, I mean, you're just like, you're soaking that all up. Now, again, these type of things. The question is, did God create lights in the sky for us to drive rovers around and play golf on? That's the question, right? <laughs> I mean, are they lights? Are they timepieces? Are they... You know, are they set in motion for signs and times, like we're told? Are they things that we're going to, like, start b- building bases on? And going Again, it's a lot of sci-fi. you got, like, you were talking Star Trek, and I was a huge Trekkie myself. you got Star Wars. you got all these things. But it's interesting when you start going to these movies after the fact, and you see yeah. that it's just nonstop programming on this entire, you know, this whole entire Big Bang cosmology that we're going to travel the stars. And, but I, I really believe that there will be deceptions coming from NASA and from science, and I think it's going to come to a point where, you know, the church, Christians are going to have to choose. At what point do we stand and go, okay, they've gone too far? That totally 100% goes against the Bible. Or are they going to keep every time they, we just discovered life. Okay, how do we put that in the Bible? Okay, God loves creating. Yeah, okay. And, you know, but again, it's going to get really muddy and it's going to continue on, you know, blurring the lines. And hopefully, you know, with all this research that's being done and even just films like Scientism Exposed, people can start questioning things, the official story. And, I mean, even, like, after what was at Apollo, the press conference, and seeing these guys after they've you know, supposedly yeah. walked on the moon, I mean, it's the greatest thing in mankind's history, and they look like they've just completely, like, you know, murdered people, and they're just completely mm-hmm. grieving. I mean, they do not look like guys that are celebrating, that have done the one big achievement that Matt has always wanted to do. And just things like that. So that's what I want to do in the film is throw just little things out. I don't want to hit them with big pictures and show them, like, look how fake that looks. I just wanted to be like, yeah, how come they wouldn't swear on the Bible? Or, or you know, these type of things. Because, again, it's like, did they really do it? And the biggest thing, I have Obama in there saying, uh, you know, we've been asked, you know, why we're not going to the moon. And, and I just got to say, uh, 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 we've already been there. You know, it's like, are you yeah. kidding me? 50 years and you're not going back? What about Russia? What about China? What about all these technological, like, Marvel, you know, countries? Nobody's going to the moon. And then everyone will say, well, we've already been there. What? I mean, I watched uh, Independence. I think it was Independence Day, the new Independence Day, because I was yeah. curious. And the beginning of that movie, wasn't it telling? You have a massive moon base. You have this friggin' like, entire colony going on there. They're detecting any threats that are coming from outer space. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, my goodness, they're right. We would completely have hotels up there. We'd be taking trips there and back for the rich. And, I mean, it's... The reality is, how in the fact, how can it happen in the 60s, 50 years almost, and they still have not been there? Because they've never have been there. It was all a big lie. Hopefully people will yeah, wake up to that. With, with technology that it doesn't even remotely compare to the technology in my iPhone, we supposedly yeah. <laughs> went, went to the to, – and you're right. I mean, we just – what, we just stopped, and we we should have – hotels for the rich up there. We should have moon bases up there for military strategic reasons. And, you know, every year it seems like around September, there's some kind of comet or asteroid headed our way. So, you know, why don't we have early detection systems all over the moon to, you know, I mean, the whole thing is just completely ridiculous. Do you think, I mean, I've heard uh, Mark Sargent say this and I tend to agree with him. I want to get your take on it. 
he said, and I agree, that the Apollo, the whole purpose of the Apollo program was to get that picture of the globe to yeah. put in the textbooks. Yeah, and, see, and, uh, yeah, and I think there's something to that, because even as a truther, even, you know, as a, a Christian, that was one thing I never, ever could really understand. I would tell people that, you know, you know, one, there's a lot of reasons why they say, you know, why it's fake. But one of them was they ended the Cold War with Russia, right? But it still didn't really, it was like, would they go to that extent just to end a Cold War with Russia? But I think there's something to it, because at that point, they have this picture, the debate, there's no debate, it's completely 100% settled. And I mean, we all know what that picture's like when we go look at it. I mean, it's just nonsense. And the fact is, it's what, 2016, 2017, there's still no HD video footage of the spinning Earth from space. Right. All these like thousands of satellites up there. I mean, and then NASA, what was it in 2015? The White House retweeted it and said, congratulations, NASA. It's almost been 50 years. You, you put out the second you know, picture of the Earth, you know, from the Apollo uh, time. And again, you start looking into these things and you're like, why is it that there really is no real photograph of the Earth? They're all composites and renderings and CGI. And again, one by one, you're kind of like, this doesn't even make any sense. I mean, how easy would it be to put a GoPro on some satellite and just, you know, record or whatever. But again, it does not exist, and that should make a lot of people suspicious of really... And I tell people, I say, if, in fact, we have not been to the moon, which I don't believe that we have, but if you open yourself up to that fact, the question is, how far have we been? Because the reality is, you start looking up since the Apollo mission up to present day, I think it's like, you know, three, 400 miles or 500 miles. Yeah, I mean, 400 miles. 240, yeah, 240,000 miles the moon is, which is just an ext- extreme distance. And yet all this time, you don't think you would be like going by the moon or past the moon or, hey, let's just let's go around, you know, let's just do a lap around the moon once just for fun because nothing. It's not even remotely close. It's not even a fraction um, of the distance. So, yeah, there's just a lot of suspicious things. But so far, I mean, it's not like they need to do very much. They, like you talked about all this money they have. They're not even spending it on special effects. The stuff they put out is garbage. It, yeah, I know. Stuff <laughs> you know. So the I question know. is, I think, I think they're kind of like, we don't need to. Like, we just don't need to. It's so ingrained in people's minds. We don't even have to really spend a lot of time or money or effort on this. We just have to throw up, you know, get some plaster scene together. Is your kid here? Great. He has plaster scene. Give me some. I'll put it in. I'll take a picture of it. And there's the new planet we discovered. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I was going to say that, that that recent video of the moon passing in front of the Earth. Oh, I mean, I, I feel like they're not even trying. I, I mean, when I yeah. saw that, I mean, I mean, a lot of people have tried to defend it and say, oh, this is just what it looks like. I just... I, I can't believe that that is, is being passed off as real. I mean, just that's, that's my opinion. I mean, Rob, you asked earlier, like, uh, about how we, we look at these things now, and I just I just started laughing when I saw that. And then, uh, But I also, I also got kind of upset because people are going to believe that that is a real picture of the, of the other side of the moon that we never see and uh, yeah, passing in front of the Earth. It's, it's but put the amazing. rover, put the rover on the moon, put that rover on the moon, or put yourself on that moon, and look how big the Earth is behind it. How come you see all these mm-hmm. pictures from the Apollo, and it's a little tiny Earth way far away? How is that possible mm-hmm. with that new picture? And then what was that picture? Mm-hmm. A million miles? They got a satellite a million miles perfectly away to take that shot? Mm-hmm. And they talked about how hard it is to take a picture of the moon, right? But what I found, I threw this in the film, just very subtle. You see a picture where the Earth is really tiny in the background, the astronaut sitting on the moon. And then the next shot, you see the Earth even bigger. And then the last shot is that one right there we're talking about right now. And the Earth is gigantic behind that little moon, right? Well, all the mm-hmm. pictures we've seen, and I mean, Rob has done some great things with Photoshop, kind of exposing the moon and looking at it that it's been, you know, Photoshopped in. But the reality is, look how tiny the Earth is when they're on the moon, right? Mm-hmm. That's something doesn't add up there. Uh, the, you know, when you're looking at the you're looking at and all these sort of things. But anyways, I just want to throw that out there because I just threw that in the movie just so people kind of look at these three images and one goes from a real tiny Earth, same moon, same moon again, bigger Earth, and then the other one is just gigantic. I mean, it, it would fill up the whole back end, you know? So, it's yeah, it's just one of those things. I think it's just a lot of Hollywood and sci-fi science fiction. It's not science. Not science fiction is what we're talking here. Well, we have uh, about five minutes left of the broadcast. What would you like to leave our audience with regarding this film? No, I just like to leave everyone with the fact that give it a give it a good shot. Like I said, it's free. You can't go on um, go on to YouTube or 
Facebook and watch watch it and uh, yeah, see what you think. And if you really like it, you want to support it, you want to, you think it's a great tool to get out to people, go to CelebrateTruth.org, uh, order a DVD. I, uh, we have them on uh, in bulk uh, pricing. If you want to order multiple copies just to hand out, we have people that are buying multiple copies just to hand out, give it to schools and different things because I think this uh, message. Um, is incredibly important, but also it definitely has a great evangelistic message uh, in the end, and I think uh, it will be great. Uh, the people that are in it, like Brian, uh, Kevin Johnson, uh, Daniel Johnson, and uh, Rich Hopkins, these guys are awesome. They've been amazing right from the beginning of the project, and they bring a lot uh, to the uh, to the film. And again, as it's put together, it will take you on a journey, and you know it's uh, it's something that uh, you shouldn't miss. At least uh, watch it once. How did you uh, – did you already know those other people that you mentioned just uh, now? Myself, uh, myself, yeah. I've got to know, uh, like, uh, a few of them. We've known each other for a while just kind of through, you know, talking there, uh, reached out to uh, – you know, I did a lot of prayer about this, like who would be involved. And like I said, when Brian was first talking about that, uh, I was I was ecstatic because I was a huge fan of uh, Brian Mullen just to work with balls of physics and just going through. I mean, I was sending his videos to people that were really hardcore into like you know physics and then you know some really extreme things. So when I saw the one day that you know here's a picture of him being baptized and see all these comments and I got a hold of him and I was just like wow. He told me his testimony and it was just amazing. So I knew at that point uh, that uh, it was going to be great because for me it was important to obviously have believers uh, on the project that could understand the deception and. And really had been in this research and understand that they were on board with a project that really we weren't going to come out and start talking about the nature, the shape of the earth, but we were going to kind of take people on that journey to get people questioning what they've been taught and uh, maybe turning them back to the truth of God's word and uh, showing them that uh, they can find all truth in the Savior. Right on. Well, that's about all the time we have for this broadcast. Hey, Brian and Robbie, thank you both for coming on this this evening uh, on the Revolutionary Radio Project. Yeah, it was great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, Rob. All right, thanks, guys. And uh, once again, check out the film. You can check it out on YouTube. It's called Scientism Exposed, and also uh, celebrate. It's, it's celebrate Truth, right? Yeah, CelebrateTruth.org. And uh, real quick, uh, Brian, what is your YouTube channel? Uh, it's just my name, Brian Mullen, uh, or search Balls Out Physics. Either one of them should bring it up. All right, Brian Mullen or Balls Out Physics. Lots of great videos for you guys to check out. Again, it's just something to, like Robbie said, get you questioning. I think it's really important for us to start questioning a lot of things these days, especially as we're trying to navigate an ocean of lies and really the the only compass we have is the word of god as our truth and you know i'll leave it leave it with that so once again thank you guys for coming on thank you guys for listening to the revolutionary radio project we'll see you back next wednesday 11 p.m central standard time good night everybody